spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. This two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Tim Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to the generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Thursday, May 18th, we are studying Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. In today's text, Jesus gives the sixth of seven letters that John is to write to the congregations in Asia Minor. This letter is addressed to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor John Busman. Pastor Busman serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cullman, Alabama. Pastor Busman, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Thank you so much, and a blessed Ascension Day to all of you. That's right. God, that's a wonderful... Wonderful feast of the church here that we should pay attention to a lot more than we do. So blessed ascension, blessed ascension. Pastor Busman, the book of Revelation, I think, has a few things to say about the ascended Lord Jesus Christ. So it is fitting that we look at the book of Revelation for ascension. Before we look at our particular text, just give me your your general thoughts on the book of Revelation. How should we approach it as Christians? Why is it an important and valuable book for us? It it is a, a, a very valuable book, and you know, growing up, I, I grew up in a in a different background, and we were always told to to avoid Revelation. That Revelation was was a frightening book and, and a book that could could shake your faith and uh, and something to to avoid as far as reading the scriptures was concerned. Uh, but when when we kind of turn to the to the Lutheran Church. Uh, and and have a uh, a unifying understanding of the scriptures. We see the great hope that Revelation offers all the way through. That it's not a book of of fear uh, and and foreboding for for the church, uh, but a book of hope, a book that encourages endurance to the end. Um, yeah, you know some of the things that that will happen as the book unfolds are a little unnerving. But the ones who are in Christ are, are safe, they are secure, because their eternal well-being is, is, uh, is sure and certain because of the victory that, that Jesus has won by his death and, uh, and resurrection. So uh, a lot of hope for us to draw from, not only in, in the text for, for today, but, but the book as a whole. Yeah, okay, so a book of hope, not a book of fear because of the certainty we have in Christ, who is our ascended Lord, who now reigns, even in the midst of all of the, the things that happen that, that might be sometimes scary, we have hope, we have confidence in our risen and ascended Lord. So we are looking today at chapter 3, the letter to the church in Philadelphia. In terms of action, not much has happened in the book of Revelation, but there is some context to consider. So, Pastor Busman, what should we know about Revelation, what we've been reading so far, what John has been seeing that will help us as we look at this particular letter today? I, I think you, you said it already in the question and the title of the book, Revelation. We, we keep in mind that this is a revelation, that, that though the text is, well, we're, we're in kind of uh, letter style here today, but uh, though the, the text reads as narrative, it is apocalyptic literature, and that's, that's a very important thing to, to remember, that the text is not uh, meant to be taken uh, literally, um, and that this type of literature, this apocalyptic literature specifically, is, is brought up in the scriptures during times of exile. So we see it with Ezekiel and Daniel in the Old Testament. Uh, this is during the time of the uh, Babylonian exile, and of course Daniel leading into the uh, the Persian kingdoms uh, rising up against Babylon. But here John has been exiled to the island of Patmos, he says, on account of the word of God and on the testimony of Jesus. So this is not a, a style of literature that, that guys just sit down and say, I think I'm going to write this way today. It occurs at very specific times in the history of the church, 
uh, very specifically around uh, around times of exile, around times of, you know, like John will be experiencing uh, at the end of his life uh, persecution. And, you know, one of the first things John sees is uh, before he ever starts to write, right, he turns and, and looks to see who the voice was speaking to him and and he sees the uh, the, the risen, ascended, and and glorified Christ, and he falls over like he's like he's dead. And I love this image because you know Jesus picks him up. He says, "All right, look, we don't have time for this. <laughs> I've got things I need you to see. I've got things I need you to do." And uh, and he basically what he sees is the same image that that Daniel sees in chapter seven. Uh, a few adjustments, of course. Uh, Jesus having come through the fiery furnace, so his feet are refined uh, as in a furnace, fur, furnace uh, burnished bronze. So that's another important thing to keep in mind. That uh, as with Ezekiel and Daniel, you know, John is is seeing the same things. He's simply on the other side of the cross. Mm-hmm. So uh, that leads us then into the letters, the seven letters to the seven churches that John will write. You mentioned that apocalyptic literature shows up for the people of God during times of exile. What what makes the time of exile an appropriate time for this sort of literature, this sort of word of God to his people? That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, it, I, think, I think first to the book of, uh, of Ezekiel, and the images of God, you know, before before all of this, you know, God, we see God in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And now all of a sudden you get to Ezekiel and you have you have God's throne with, with wheels and all these strange images and the wheels are full of eyes. And it's like nobody has, has seen scriptures like this before. So you get these crazy interpretations all over the place. But... Um, uh, but when you when you break it down, you actually do see that it that it makes sense. Um, if first we have an understanding of the rest of the scriptures, we have to have an understanding of the rest of the scriptures. Um, oftentimes, when I talk about this, it's looking like a uh, putting together a puzzle. Mm-hmm. You kind of dump all the pieces out all over the place, and and when you're doing the activity, you're not picking out the solid blue pieces and the solid green pieces that have strange edges and trying to put them together first. You put the edges together first and then, you know, finally in the end, you can fi- you can see if the, the blue you're holding is, is a lake or if it's sky, you just kind of got to let it fall where it, uh, where it does, but that's not where you start. And with these books like Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation, that's kind of what we have to do. We've got to put the rest of the scriptures together first and, and let these pieces, uh, let these pieces fall into place, but but consider during the times of exile, whether it's Babylon uh, or whether it's John on Patmos and the impending um, persecution by Trajan, there is a lot of uncertainty in the church. Has God abandoned his people? Does God have control over what is happening or is everything just kind of chaotic and unknown? And that's really where the where the text goes after our text you know who who can who can break these seals and, and open the scroll but to to cut through all of the uncertainty and the kind of strangeness of the things that are going around to the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead and has control over the things of the end and when we're when we're kind of around the things that Christ does there's, there's calm, there's peace, there's singing. You know, worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain. Uh, everything else is, is chaotic and unknown and uncertain. But, but, but in Christ, there is victory. In Christ, there is peace. Uh, there is hope. There is certainty. Yeah. So um, there, there's a lot to draw there, I believe. Yeah, well, and, and so the way that apocalyptic literature forces the reader to go to those texts that are much more well-known, those texts that are certain, where you hear the promises of Christ very clearly, those going back into those texts, then and and then understanding this apocalyptic literature in that same line, as you said at the outset, not in the way of fear, but in the way of hope, 
then that apocalyptic literature does become a source of, of great comfort that, that you as a Christian and that the church is going to get. You are going to understand that great comfort. The world around you, the Babylonians, the Romans, they're going to look at the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel, and they're going to say, what in the world is this? This makes no sense. But to the Christian, it does make sense, and there is great certainty in that, knowing that, that Christ is, is caring for his church. Yes, it looks like your enemies, they're in control, but here, read this. They're not going to get it, but you are, and that's the certainty that you have. And I think that really, I mean, again, in the time of exile, that makes apocalyptic literature all the more comforting. Right, and later on, you know, this it's almost like the battle lines are drawn, and you're expecting swords to be drawn and, and to figure out and see what's going to happen, and the ne- the very next verse says, and, and fire came down from heaven and consumed them. It's like, it's, it's not even a fight, it's it's over with. It's not something to be concerned about. That And that doesn't mean that everything in the book is just going to all of a sudden be clear as crystal because we have an understanding of the rest of the Bible, but I, I do believe that having a better understanding of the rest of the scriptures. When we come to books like this, I, I think it's a little bit easier to, the things that we don't understand, I think it's a little easier to, to put those aside and say, okay, it, it really doesn't matter if we know exactly what's going to happen on what day, but Christ does and he rules over it. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we have in Revelation 3, the letter to the church in Philadelphia. This is the sixth of seven. I'm going to go ahead and read the text for us here. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have not and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world, to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is our text for today, Revelation 3, verses 7 to 13. Pastor Busman, this letter starts similarly to the others. Let's just catch a few of these details here at the beginning. The letter is written to the angel of the church. How do you take the angel of the church? Who is that? Right. So in common interpretation, the angel of the church is John is not writing to a, you know, a cherub or, or something like this, but, uh, you know, the word is messenger, uh, angel, uh, often seen as the pastor, um, the, the pastor of the church, right? So these letters, even Paul's letters, when he writes to those churches, the letter is going to be presented in, you know, the context of, of worship to the church. It's going to be read by someone, and, you know, we're not taking volunteers here. Uh, so it's very specifically to the uh, to the bishop, I guess, would be a more appropriate word of okay. the church in in Philadelphia. Right. That's that's generally the way we've been, been thinking about these angels in these letters. Later in the book of Revelation, we will see angels who are the heavenly beings, cherubim and so forth. Right. But it does seem in this context that the angels are the pastors or the bishops of these churches. This one is written to the, the pastor of the church in Philadelphia. Now, we know the American city, Philadelphia. What? Where is this Philadelphia? Do we know anything about it? Yeah, your listeners on KFUO would think... Uh... Pennsylvania, but we got a Philadelphia down here in Mississippi too. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> so, but that's a good, yeah. So it's a good, it's kind of a good point because you have to ask which Philadelphia is it? There, it's not, there's not just one city in the world named Philadelphia. We run into this already in the, in the New Testament with Caesarea, which Caesarea is it? Caesarea by the sea? Is it Caesarea Philippi? Which Antioch is it? Which Tarsus is it? So there, we, we have all of these different cities you know, with the same name, uh, but it is, I guess it, it, it's thought that 
it is likely the one that's in closest proximity to these other cities. Uh, John is told to write seven letters to the seven churches that are in Asia. And there is a, a Philadelphia, uh, which contextually, some of these verses that we'll look at um, kind of makes makes a little more sense geographically if we're looking to the Philadelphia that is um, uh, to the east of Ephesus. Uh, Constantinople is to the north. If you track Paul's missionary journeys, uh, this is a city he, he could have gone through on his second missionary journey. Uh, you know, the, the text does not specifically tell us, but if you're kind of drawing dots between the cities and looking at the ancient roads that exist there, Paul could have been through here on his second journey. Um, this Philadelphia was established in the later intertestamental period, so we see the, the Old Testament come to an end around the year 430 B.C., and the New Testament begins with the birth of Jesus around 6 B.C., um, but in the, in the later part of that intertestamental period is when the city was, was established. And um, really the only other thing that, that uh, at least I'm aware of, I haven't really read much of Tacitus, but there was an earthquake. There, Philadelphia is prone to earthquakes in this, in this region. And there was an earthquake uh, in Jesus' life before his ministry began in the year 17. Uh, so there was a pretty significant earthquake there. But this is not a place like, say, when when uh, John writes to Smyrna, you know, well, Polycarp was the pastor. He was the bishop in Smyrna. We know this, right? right. right. We know about Ephesus. We don't really know much about the church in, you know, this church in Philadelphia. But, I, but you know, the, the words that John writes kind of lends to that, that we don't know, that we don't know much. So we'll get into some of that in, uh, yeah. in just a little bit, but, but like the other cities in the area, you know, full of pagan temples and, uh, idol worship and things like this. So th there are some similarities to other cities, but sure. also some things that we, we just don't know. Sure. Sure. So, okay. We've got the, the letter to the angel in the church in Philadelphia. Jesus is speaking and he identifies himself in each one of these letters. He identifies himself with different characteristics. He starts by saying, he, he's right, these are the words of the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David. The, the Most of the emphasis, it seems, falls on the fact that Jesus holds the key of David. But I don't want to skip over too quickly, at least. Talk about the fact that Jesus is the Holy One and the True One. Yeah, the Holy One. Be holy. Uh, Leviticus 19, I believe. Uh, wait, is it Leviticus 19 that says, Be perfect, as I, the Lord your God, am perfect? And then I think Jesus it's be holy. Said, yeah, yeah, and then it's, Jesus, it's be holy. Yeah, Jesus be holy. says, "Be perfect." So, be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Be uh, the 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 word holy, set apart, right? Not like anything else. He's the holy. You know, the the world and the people in the world can create whatever kind of idols, whatever kind of god they want to create. But but Christ our Lord is not like any of them because he is the he is the one true God. He is the one set apart from the rest. No matter what. They think that they can do, um, and I'm already thinking. I'm thinking back to the the time of exile, thinking to uh, to Isaiah, which we'll look at in in just a minute. That what Isaiah really brings out that that distinguishes God from the rest is that God knows the things before they happen. Mm -hmm. right? He even calls Cyrus by name before Cyrus even exists, uh, and and this is one of the things that will distinguish. Uh, the one true God from the gods of Babylon. They, they're they reactive gods, but God knows. And uh, and I think that's one of the things that sets God apart in, in Revelation as well, is that he is the one who knows all things, and he is the one who has control over all of these things. Later on, of course, we'll see the forces of evil at work, uh, led by the dragon, led by the devil, the deceiver, the liar. So the opposite of God, not holy and true, but but uh, but defiled and evil. So um, God is distinguished from from all of those things. So he is the Holy One. He is the true one. And as you said, the, the Holy One, the, the Leviticus quote, and this is the way that the Lord will often identify himself, or sometimes Isaiah will point to the Lord as the Holy One in his book. 
And then we come to this Holy One, True One, holds the key of David. This, I think, is a reference back to Isaiah. So the way that Jesus speaks it, he's holding the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. Take us into that reference. What's Jesus saying? Uh, yeah, as we started, you know, kind of knowing the rest of the scriptures allows us to kind of use the pieces of Revelation to fill in. And you're right, this goes back to uh, Isaiah 22. I had to do a, uh, a, a search here to, to look at this. Um, it's one of those things you, you learn and you knew it was somewhere, but <laughs> you, you, you forget. But uh, a great section in Isaiah 22 where it is written, In that day I will call on my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe, and will bind your sash on him, and will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut. He shall shut, and none shall shall open. And then he goes on, another interesting image, if we carry it on, it says, I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. Uh, that whole section really fits here very well in Revelation chapter 3. But this Eliakim was a servant of uh, the great king uh, Hezekiah, and uh, so key of David, um, given keys, given authority to open, to close, and no one's going to come along behind him and shut. No one else can uh, can can open. Uh, I think, you know, when we hear key of David, I don't know that our mind immediately goes to Isaiah 22 or even Revelation 3. I think our mind immediately goes to the Advent Hymn O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Sure. Um, and it's just kind of a phrase that's lost on us as far as where the referent is in the scriptures. I mean, it was something that, that uh, you know, didn't, again, you know it's written somewhere, but okay, where is it? And, and, you, and you do a search, and, and there it is in, in Isaiah 22. Um, but John, you know, another aspect of the interpretation of Revelation is John did not only write Revelation. He wrote three letters, three other letters, and he wrote, the gospel. And does John speak of keys and doors, right, um, in his gospel? And yeah, he, he does. It's kind of a theme that he, that he carries through, and we can get into that uh, maybe, maybe more in a minute. But Jesus is not like Eliakim, who is you know, temporarily given the keys of David who will, who will die. Jesus is the true key of David. What he opens, there is none who can come behind and shut. And when yeah. he shuts, no, none can come behind and, and open. Um, again, encouragement and hope on the one hand for the church, but a great warning for for those uh, outside. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the reference to Isaiah is, is clearly in view. And John has already seen Jesus, as you said, at the beginning of the book in chapter 1. And when Jesus speaks to John... He tells John that he has, there he has the keys of death and Hades. So again, we've got Jesus with keys yet again here in Revelation chapter 3. And you mentioned the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, uh, which is based on the, the great O Antiphons for the season of Advent. And I, I do think that the, the way that that hymn teaches us to think about this image is helpful. So this is in Lutheran service book number 357, and it stands a five that makes this reference. O come, thou key of David, come, and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high, and close the path to misery. So, I mean, notice how that, that stanza includes both the thought of opening something and closing something, both for the comfort of God's people, that the one who holds the key of David, what's he going to do with that key? He's going to open the door to heaven, and he's going to close the path to eternal death. Both of those are a comfort to us. Right, for sure, and and again, fitting very nicely here with the context of of Revelation three, as you know, John really gets into the into the letter, encouragement, and warning, encouragement for those inside, stark warning for those um, 
who are not confessors of Christ yeah. as that's right. That's right. Victorious. And even in that, you know, just um, as you were talking with apocalyptic literature and exile, the thought of Jesus holding keys when you are locked up in exile, I think is, is good news. He, he comes to set the prisoners free, more Advent themes here. No, that's right. That's exactly right. And, and again, back to Isaiah, if we, if we kind of carry the image through, their deliverance from exile, I mean, you, you can look at the immediate interpretation and see them going home from Babylon but you also carry it into the into the end, as Isaiah does in chapter sixty-five, into the new heavens and the new earth, like Revelation does, and it's 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 a deliverance, not in haste or in chaos, but a deliverance in peace, right? Still waters and and bread to the full and and, and all of these things. So there's there is great comfort. I I, I wish, uh, you know, maybe. I commend commend you for doing a study on Revelation on the show, but but uh, we need to we need to be studying this book more in That's our right. churches as well. Yeah, receive this comfort from the one who is holy and true, holding the key of David to set us free, to take us into eternal life. We're going to keep looking at this letter on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor John Busman about Revelation three this morning. We will be right back. Please stick around. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, May 18th. We're studying Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 to 13 with Pastor John Busman. He serves at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Coleman, Alabama. Pastor Busman, prior to the break, we looked at Jesus' opening in identification of himself to the church in Philadelphia. And then in verse 8, he begins the letter. He says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. So he says he knows their works, which we've heard him speak this way to previous churches, but then he moves pretty quickly to this this open door that he's put there. Nobody's able to shut it. You mentioned doors from John's gospel. Uh, how's that going to help us understand what's going on here in verse 8? Yeah, that's a it's kind of one of those things you can either another comfort or, or a terror for you. Uh, when When Christ looks at you and says, I know your works, you know, is that a good, or is that, uh-oh, um, <laughs> better right. yeah. need to repent. <laughs> yeah, he's set, be- so he's got the keys, and he's set before them an open door, and, and no one is able to shut. So when John, in his gospel, uses this language of, of a door, it's in chapter 10. Right. And Jesus says, I am the door for, for the sheep. Um, you know, it's in the context of, of the Good Shepherd, which we heard uh, several weeks ago during the Easter season. Uh, so he's the door. He's the way into the sheep pen. Uh, who goes in and out? The sheep. Who stays out? Well, you know, the, the one who comes in by another way is the, is the thief who comes to steal and kill and uh, and destroy, but ultimately the door is is for the sheep, for the believers, um, and I think that's good to have kind of in our mind as we as we continue to uh, to look at the text. Other places that we see doors, not necessarily in John's gospel, but we have parables of um, wedding feasts. We have the wise and the foolish maidens. Who's responsible for opening that door and, and shutting that door? Well, once that door is shut, you can knock all you want to, but but once it's shut, it's not being opened again, and, and the foolish ones 
are um, are left outside. So, to again, when we're, when we've got the image of how we're looking at Revelation, to use those other texts and to use the pieces of Revelation to to fill in, I, I do think is helpful. So, with the the open door here in the church in Philadelphia, the those who are in the church in Philadelphia have entered through this door already. They are the beloved sheep of Jesus. He has called them in. They are dwelling in his, in his fold. The door is still open, and no one's able to shut it. So, I mean, uh, the, and as you mentioned, when the door gets closed in the Gospels and you're left outside, that's bad news. Here the door's still open. Nobody's going to shut it un- until that appointed time when, when the Lord returns. So is there is there some comfort here to the church as as she would proclaim the gospel that yes you, you have entered through the door keep proclaiming that that open door in Christ no one can shut it and even if they persecute you for it keep proclaiming I will keep this door open as long as I as long as I will right Something I do like think that. yes and there are, there are several commentators who who you know really focus on the mission of the church with this sixth letter that the you know that the door for mission is uh is open and and you know that is that is right you know Philadelphia is only one of two churches that are really commended for for their work you know what they're doing they are and and the second half of this verse will get more into that but you know look at Corinth for example you know Corinth there's not one gift of the spirit that they don't have yet rather than using their gift for the benefit and the building up of the church, they're using their gifts to tear one another down. And therefore they're not a, a witness, a faithful witness of the gospel. Philadelphia, on the other hand, is also kind of on a, on a busy street, so to speak. I mean, they're out there, they've got people constantly passing by, gateway to the east and you know they could by their work by their proclamation of the gospel be a light uh not only to the to the ones of the synagogue of satan but also to the to the gentiles who are coming through so yeah i I, that's that's a proper interpretation i believe is to to consider this as uh, being focused on the proclamation of the gospel the mission of the church that you know, the door's not shut yet, as as you said. So it's not like I'm in and everything's going to be fine. You know, I'm in, but there's still more room. Yeah, the door's not shut yet. So yeah. keep proclaiming. Yeah, yeah. So and as you said, Jesus within this letter does not really have much critique as he did in other epistles. The other ones usually had something that was commended, but also something that Jesus says he has against them. Here, there, we don't really have that in the letter to the Philadelphia. Of, of all seven, this one seems to be the most positive in that sense. So Jesus says more about what he knows. I know that you have but little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. That is a, a wonderful commendation from Jesus. Oh, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's what you want Christ to say. I, I know that you have but little power, but you, you have kept my word, you have not denied my name. You can imagine all of the things that they face just from other letters that we have from Paul or from John here, these churches in in this uh, in Asia Minor, what they faced and what they would face even after the days of the New Testament. But but these are these are Christians who have not uh, who have not denied. These are Christians who have kept the word. He says that you are of but you are of little power, and again encouragement for for the church because you would expect you know if if they're the ones who have kept the word if they're the ones who have uh not denied the name that they would be the one at the top of the list that you know paul would be visiting that he would be writing that you know their pastors would all be known that uh you know one of the apostles would be their their bishop for for a long long time but it's it's the opposite they're Mm -hmm. They're really unknown. We don't have a lot of their history. Uh, what makes them be of little power? Maybe it's that Paul doesn't write to them, visit them, uh, that they don't have an apostle as their bishop. Maybe they're a newer church. But again, using the Gospels, using the other scriptures here, 
what does God do with the weak and the lowly? He, he raises them up. He exalts the lowly. Consider the Magnificat to, yeah. to Mary. Look at all of the people that Jesus encounters in the New Testament who the Pharisees consider unworthy to, uh, to, to receive any kind of good. Yet those are the ones who, who Christ goes to. Mm. Um, I, I think this is great encouragement for our churches now as, you know, I know people are probably tired of hearing about 2019 and 2020, but, but there, there are places who are still really reeling from that and, and not maybe not knowing what they're going to do. Maybe the church five or 10 miles up the road is, you know, going through the same things and, you know, you may be confronted with a, with a dual parish and you look at the history of the church and you say, but what, but why? we've been, we've been faithful. We've been a beacon in our community. Why is this happening to us and not, you know, somebody else who, who has been unfaithful? Um, I I would encourage the letter to Philadelphia for you and, and to continue to keep the word and, and not deny, deny the name. Perhaps this is, uh, the opportunity to, to be a light to, uh, to the community, to the world even. Yeah, yeah. Even if you have little power, those are the ones Jesus chooses. Those are right. the ones that he he calls, and he continues to use those who have not denied his name. Now, within the church in Philadelphia, or within the the city of Philadelphia, there is what is called a, a synagogue of Satan, and we've encountered a synagogue of Satan before in a previous letter to the the church in Smyrna. The synagogue of Satan was mentioned there. Now, remind us of of what this is referring to. And what Jesus says specifically to the church in Philadelphia. In this yeah, period. you know, as, as the church uh, really really takes root there at Pentecost and, and Acts 2, um, the, the center of worship is no longer the synagogue. The, these, the people who had been children of Abraham, sons of Abraham, but are not confessors of Christ— as the one true God who has come to save, are, um, you know, it's one or the other. It's not well. You're you're kind of in between. It's 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 Christ or um, the devil inside or uh, or outside. You know, Paul when he's on his missionary journeys, the first place he goes is the synagogue. Right? But he goes not to just hang out. He goes to proclaim Christ as risen from the dead to uh, to bring them into the fold of the church, right? So those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. So we started with truth, and now we have lie tied with um, with Satan, the, the dragon, the, the great liar. Say they are Jews. Say they are Judahites, descendants of the promise, but they miss the promise fulfilled. Jesus has this discussion, I guess if you could call it a discussion, back, same author, in in John chapter 8, where, well, we're sons of Abraham, we've never been enslaved to to anyone, and Jesus says, no, you're you're children of your father, uh, the devil, and he reveals himself as the one true God who revealed himself to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, and Moses in the burning bush before Abraham was, I am. And they too, in John 8, turn on him. They pick up stones to to throw at, at them. Here, though, um, he says, Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. So, you know, starts off where it could be a, a an area where you know Jesus could could be going after uh, the these but do we have repentance here mm. if if the ones here of the synagogue of Satan actually turn and come down and fall before your before the feet and learn that I have loved you as a result of the F- Christians in Philadelphia as a result of their proclamation of the gospel, have they turned and repented? Um, I 
personally, I think it fits with with the previous statement that Jesus has said about the Philadelphians and and that yeah. they uh, have kept the word. They've not denied my name, that they are kind of this faithful witness. Um, the door is open, right? It's not, they're not, they're not clawing at the door trying to get in at the end of time. They, they seem to turn beforehand. So I I don't know, I don't know what we make of this. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's, there's definitely a possibility that in what Jesus says here to the church in Philadelphia, as he's addressing what, what will happen with the synagogue of Satan, those who have not trusted in the promised Messiah, I think that there, there does seem to be at least that possibility open that what Jesus is saying is that some of them, at least, will be brought to the saving faith through your proclamation of the Word. I mean, as opposed to, say, what, what Jesus said in the letter to Thyatira, where you've got that false prophetess Jezebel, and she receives a judgment. I mean, you, you know what's going to happen to her. Here, as he talks about the synagogue of Satan and this thought of, of them coming to bow down at the church's feet and learn that Jesus has loved his church— I mean, again, I suppose we could think about that in terms of the last day, that at the last day, every knee will bow before Jesus, believer or unbeliever. And so that that could be it. But I, I think at least, again, with that thought of the open door, that at least the possibility of some of them coming to the faith in the promised Messiah, I think it's I think it's in view. Uh, I, I mean, it, it might, I think, it, I, I'm with you, that at least that could be in view there. So let's, let's keep working then. Uh, in verse 10, Jesus says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Uh, I love the the turn of phrase here. You have kept my word. I will keep you. Uh, take us into to verse 10. Yeah, you've kept my word. Consider, again, this area of the world. The, the word is all they have. These Christians in this part of the world did not have the luxury. I mean, they, they lived at the, at the same time Jesus was in his ministry, healing, preaching, teaching. Yet they, they weren't in Jerusalem, likely. You know. um, they were in a different part of the world. Can you imagine living at the exact same time in the world as, as Jesus was in his ministry, but living in a different part of the world, not seeing any of it? So all they have is his word. Uh, they didn't necessarily have the luxury of constant visitation by Paul or having an apostle as a pastor, those eyewitnesses. They have the word. Um, but again, the warning, there is an hour that is coming, uh, an hour of trial, an hour of suffering that is coming. Persecution was coming to the church very quickly after this, during uh, Emperor Trajan, all, already in, in 98. Um, but as we go beyond the letters, even, we can go beyond that specific persecution. So that may be an immediate interpretation, uh, an immediate fulfillment, but we're going to start seeing the horsemen ride that you know, these things that are happening, the war, the peace being taken from the earth, the economic turmoil and the death, it happens at any given point in the world, someplace in the world, not all over, but in specific places. And Christ is going to spare the Philadelphian Christians from that. Mm. He's, he's going to spare them. Uh, so again, encouraging, right? Yeah. Your eyes, sure. are, your, your eyes are going to uh, your ears are going to hear some terrible things that are happening, but you're going to be spared. Yeah. From yeah. Them. And Jesus promises in verse 11 that he is coming soon. And so the encouragement, the command, hold fast so that no one will seize your crown. So again, I mean, you know, the patient endurance, the the having little power but not denying my name, all of that kind of comes together, it seems, there in verse 11. Yeah, and he says they're coming soon. And the very next letter, these Laodiceans, they, they really don't have this sense of urgency that yeah. that the Philadelphian Christians we'll, do. We'll talk about he, the latest. Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into that text. Uh, I like I like having the encouraging one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, so uh, yeah, hold hold fast so that they might they might not take your crown. And and this is also another kind of unfortunately popular theology that 
especially, uh, you know, I don't know how it is in, in other parts of the country, but kind of this once you're saved, you're always saved mm. business, despite having warning after warning after warning in the scriptures that, that you can, in fact, lose your salvation. Um, you know, and here too, you have, you have a crown, you can lose it. Mm-hmm. So endure to the end. Uh, so I, I do, you know, the, yeah. there's hope, there's encouragement, but I do think, you know, the, the warning is there as well. Yeah. So then Jesus in verse 12 uh, speaks words that he has spoken throughout these letters. He speaks to the one who conquers, that is the one who has faith in him as the conquering Lord. Here the promise to the one who conquers is this. Jesus says, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. So there's a couple of elements here. The first one, it seems to be a pillar in the temple, and you'll never leave. Talk about that. Okay, so the pillar in the temple, I... I like to take that back to that Isaiah 22 text. I think it's a nice bookend to this letter when, you know, he, he speaks in Isaiah 22, you know, not only about the key of uh, the house of David, but he says, verse 23, I will fasten him like a peg in a secure place. You have a peg in a secure place, um, you know, like a pillar. So I, I, I do like to pull that image back in. But also the, in, in reference, as we began, to which Philadelphia is this? You know, this, this is another area that it fits with the one in proximity, that Philadelphia was a region with um, many pretty significant earthquakes. Um, and out of, it's also interesting that out of the seven churches that are mentioned here, Philadelphia remains, uh, but only, only one pillar. In, in these ruins remains in the church in, in Philadelphia. As far as the never going out, uh, that to me, uh, and, and I'm sure there are other places in the scriptures, but it immediately brings to mind the Passover in Exodus 12, where once the people put the blood of the lamb on the door, they're told to go in the house and don't, do not go out of the house. Bad things are happening outside of the house, but in the house you are safe. Why? Because of the lamb, the blood of the lamb. Again, yeah. rev- revelation imagery there, the one like a lamb who was slain is now is now reigning. So uh, Passover, Isaiah 22, uh, with, the, with the peg, with the pillar, I will write on him the name of my God. It's hard not to have baptismal imagery there. Uh, the, written on you the name of my God, as opposed to later in Revelation, what will be the mark of the, the beast, right. right? What is written on the forehead? What is written on the hand? And, and we have the assurance, the certainty that God has marked us with his own name. Yeah. Well, and that's a, I mean, there's even a, a bit of a Passover connection there too, the idea of the blood marking you as the one who belongs to Christ. Right. So now the name of God marks you. Uh, and I mean, and, and notice how, I guess, uh, how complete that is. You have the name of God, you have the name of the new Jerusalem, you have my own new name. So you, there's no doubt that, I guess, the, God's name is written on, on the front cover, the back cover, and on every page in between, something like that. I, don't, I well, mean, yeah, I don't know, is there something else to all the names? It's really nice, and, and, you know, go all the way back to Genesis, and how often do we see God restoring and giving new life to people through a new name. Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel. You know, over and over and over we see this. Uh, the new Jerusalem, all right, the, the people of God. You see this come to fulfillment in, in chapter 21, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And it's, it's his people, the ones, the ones in, the ones who have been led through the door, uh, because he, the key, opened that door, endured to the end, and restoration is coming. We endure but a little while to have uh, uh, the new heavens and new earth eternally. 
And Jesus concludes this letter as he has previous ones. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What's that? What does that mean? I, that, that kind of recalls some of the parables that Jesus speaks. And again, I, I know I've said this multiple times in, in the last uh, hour or, or however long we've been, we've been going, but there is this kind of, you're in, you're in, you're out, you're out. Uh, both hope and warning. For the Philadelphians, it is hope, um, but the call to endure, right? You have an ear, let him hear, lest you are left outside in that place there is darkness, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, so the, the, the language of the scriptures is uh, familiar to us, and where the language of the scriptures is familiar, I think we need to be going back to those more familiar text and looking at those contexts and yeah. it brings more color to the book of Revelation. Sure, sure. We've got about two and a half minutes here, Pastor Busman. As you re reflect on the letter to the church in Philadelphia, one in which the church receives primarily commendation and continued encouragement and faithfulness, help us to wrap things up. How, how do we as Christians in the United States of America in 2023, how do we take this letter for our benefit as Christians today, and we can't take the take the hope of the Word of God uh, from from the text. To um, though maybe having little power, keep the word, not deny the name, to endure, to be ready, and and not necessarily to be ready for some distant day that that may not come for a thousand years, but to be as ready as this Sunday, in word and sacrament, to be as ready as receiving that foretaste of the end. Um, so many, unfortunately, believe that and have been taught that Revelation is a, is a frightening book, is a, is a scary book, but it, it's not for those who are in Christ. The warnings do exist, uh, but Christ, the risen, ascended and glorified Christ, is coming soon and will deliver us from all of the evil of the land into the land of all things new. And in that place, there will be no pain, no mourning, no crying, no suffering or death. In that place, there will only be the tree of life yielding its fruit each month. This text is a call to endure and to trust in the promises of God. Pastor John Busman is pastor at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Coleman, Alabama. He has been helping us today to study Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. Pastor Busman, thanks for being our guest today. I appreciate it. Y'all have a great day. Jesus holds the key of David. He opens, no one else shuts. He shuts, no one else opens. He has opened the door to eternity for you. He has closed the path to eternal death, and that door stands open still today, dear Christian. Jesus has brought you into his sheepfold, and as you proclaim that gospel, do not lose heart. As you hold fast to his word, do not lose heart. The door is open, no matter what persecution you may endure. Christ's word stands true. Keep proclaiming the truth. Keep holding to the truth that more would join us in this sheepfold of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about the letter to the church in Philadelphia, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.